This episode of Salmon Cast is sponsored by Wild for Salmon. Wild caught Alaskan seafood direct from our store to your door since 2004. Order now at wildforsalmon.com and use the promo code PODCAST at checkout and you'll get 10% off your first order. That's wildforsalmon.com, promo code PODCAST at checkout. Welcome back to Salmon Cast the podcast about wild adventures fueled by wild seafood. And today we are back with Steve and Jen to talk a little bit about what we're dubbing this episode called How to Build a Business, or so we thought. Um, And before we get to that topic today, we do have some more You Ask, We Answer questions. This is a segment that we do where you submit questions about wild seafood, wild adventures, uh, or any of the products or cooking that we promote on our channel. So we're going to start with Jen. Um, and Jen, how many servings are there in one salmon fillet? Well, a whole salmon fillet usually averages about a pound and a half. Um, it ranges anywhere from a, a pound up to two pounds, but typically you can f- get four servings. Uh, out of one whole fillet. Okay. So what do you typically recommend um, when we're, just to expound upon that, we offer both full fillets and portions um, through both Pride of Bristol Bay and Wild for Salmon. What do you recommend? Is there a, is there a rule of thumb for your family size as to what's better for you to order price-wise and just value-wise to go from fillets and portions? I think it has it mostly would have to do with how many people you're serving at one time. So if you're a family of two, um, I probably would choose to do two portions uh, unless you wanted some leftovers for lunch the next day. But with the whole filet, it's easier to cook it all at one time and you will get about four, four nice size servings out of a filet. So you could have... If you're serving four people, that's great. We have four four in our family, and a fillet is perfect. And two of them are children, so. Good. Steve, our next question is, why is wild salmon so expensive? Yeah, well, it wasn't very expensive when we started. Um, you know, <laughs> there the demand wasn't there, and farm, farm fish was um, really had taken a big, big chunk of the market. So over the last 19 years, as I've kind of watched this whole thing kind of unfold is, you know, we set out to, as fishermen, we were complaining that like, we're not getting paid anything to catch these fish that, you know, we'd love to eat them. And like, why, why are we not getting as much as we used to, um, when the demand was higher and the Japanese played a bigger part in, in, in buying a lot of the wild Alaskan sockeye. So we, the whole industry set out to improve the quality of our fish and um work to actually build a brand around it and um so through the process of adding refrigeration to our boats and an extra you know a fifty thousand dollar expense to the to the boat um to put this system in so you can chill the fish and take really good care of it and then now we have you know things like tarps that uh, act as like a salmon trampoline to keep it from getting bruised and um, we have an extra guy on board just to bleed fish, and all his job is, is to, to break a gill to get the blood out so that that fish can last two years in your freezer, right? So, like, before, the boats were non-refrigerated, um, so it was going, a lot of the fish was going into the can. When I say the can, I mean canned salmon. And then um, a little bit was H&G, which is then, you know, sold whole or filleted at a later point. And... Um, so as, as that demand grew and the, the whole health food kick kind of like took over and we everybody started to look different at, you know, processed foods and big farms and farm fish, um, it just drove more and more people into looking at wild salmon. And I think, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty impressed with the job we've done from the direct marketers like ourselves to the, the bay and the, and the fishermen for putting up such a quality of product that we've really built a demand for it. And 
you know, the last seven years we've had big runs, um, kind of topping out some of the biggest runs and we're still demanding a strong price and selling through all the product in the single year, which is amazing. I mean, there was years in the past that it would be like December before last year's fish was sold out, you know, so it was a year and a half old before it got out of the grocery store. And, um, so I think that that's just, it's, it's the health food side of things. Um, the cost of our boats are really expensive. You know, I mean, my first boat was $32,000 and you know, when we built the Ava Jane, it was $550,000 and now they're a million bucks, you know? So like it just costs a lot of money to function in, in Western Alaska. You know, you think about what it t- costs to run a business and then you think about transplanting that business, you know, a stone throw away from Russia <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like in a summer environment, harsh winter environment, like it just takes a lot of money to get that product caught, cared for, processed, shipped back to Seattle, and then delivered. So um, that segues segues into today's um, topic nicely. That um, in the last episode. We talked a little bit about how you purchased the first boat, which was, you know, taking equity out of your home that you had built. Can you take a step back and share with us a little bit uh, about the process of building your house <laughs> and the story of, of, of that? Yeah, that's a story, I guess. Um, well, I think we, so that was 2004. 2003 the winter of 2003 no two no the the winter of two, yeah 2003 into 2004 because we got married in 2004 right. so i was flying back and forth to idaho i did a stint cutting timber for a helicopter outfit in in idaho with one of the guys we fished with and so i was flying back and forth and a piece of property caught my eye that was really close to where i lived with my parents at the time when i was home and so I made an offer on it and we bought it. So it was like, we bought 18 acres. And uh, so we're like, Oh, we'll, we'll build a cabin on it. And then we're going to keep like going West and living in Alaska or doing something. We weren't, I wasn't staying in Pennsylvania. Like I'm not staying. Right. It was like, I had my mind set up. Um, so I, I, you know, being roughly 24, I didn't want to move back in with my parents. So I, there was a garden shed on the property and two old trailers. So I moved into the garden shed with a dirt floor and Jen was teaching in, in Lancaster. So she'd come up on the weekends and we'd work on cleaning up the property. And I spent my time in the garden shed and, uh, spring came around and we decided that we were going to build a garage with an apartment above it. And, um, and then we had this grand plan of building a, you know, this, great house next door in the future if we wanted to, and this would be the garage. So I do remember going to the bank. This is like the funny things that I remember, but, uh, I went to the bank and I was all nervous and I sat down with this guy and he's, you know, well-dressed and, you know, seemed to be middle-aged to me. And, and, uh, he's like, sorry, can't give you a loan. You know, people don't build their own houses and like they fall through on it and they're just not going to, So obviously that pissed me off and I stormed out of there and, uh, you know, we had like, I don't know, 15, 20,000 bucks saved up. So, um, my cousin and I dug the foundation, laid the block, poured the concrete, stood the walls up. Jen would help on the weekends. Um, her dad would help and a few other friends would stop by and just kind of like help us plug along. And, um, so we got it to the point where it was, it was board and batten, two story. We had the, we had the siding on the roof on no windows cause we couldn't afford them. And, um, I was getting ready to leave for Alaska. Jen was, she had the summer off, but she was still working during the summer in Lancaster. And so every time she'd get a paycheck, she'd go buy insulation and, and her, <laughs> her and her dad would put, would work on insulating the house <laughs> while I was gone. And then came home, had, had some money. So then I wired the house and drywalled it, 
and and then the bank finally and we still have the appraisal it's like a half done house they come out and did the appraisal on the pictures and stuff and so then they were like okay you guys are going to build a house like here we'll give you an extra i don't remember if it was now 20. that it's almost done <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like an extra 20,000 bucks or whatever to finish it. So we had pretty much built the house from scratch. And, and by going through that process, we didn't have much of a loan on it. And then that's where, and I, at the time, I had no idea what equity was, you know, in a house. And so when somebody brought it to my attention, like that's how you could finance your permit is through that equity. We had the house appraised and it's like, oh. So how, how long was it from start to finish from when you started the house till it was done? We started it in March when the ground, the snow was just breaking and we finished it in October, I was putting the stone on the fireplace. Wow, that's pretty quick. And we were already moved in. But we in. were living in it, yeah, because we got married in May. May, yeah. Right. So we lived in it all summer. So how, how nervous were you, Jen, or Steve, depending upon, <laughs> which he doesn't get, but um, when you took that equity out, and then like put it into like a fishing business. Well, I at that point I wasn't worried because I was still teaching. Okay. There was still other income. Right. Um, and you were still doing the tree care work. Yeah, we were doing the tree care work. Like I always, I just always felt that I could like make ends meet. I think like every every juncture like that when we were making an investment in something, it was always like we got this. Like we've never leveraged ourselves to the hill and been in like afraid of something going wrong. Like I always felt that, you know, you could, you could go get a job somewhere and pay that permit off just with your, you know, on, on, on a normal salary or something. How many like seasons did it take you to pay the, the permit off? Do you remember? It didn't take us very long. Um, I don't remember exactly, don't but know. it was only like two or three years. Wow. But we were also like super frugal, like right. everything went to that. Like we were really kind of. We put used windows in the house. We, yeah. we, we drove <laughs> <laughs> north. They were in, I don't know, Lancaster Farmer or some kind of magazine. And uh, drove north, looked at them, put them on a trailer and brought them home and then built the house around the windows. Yeah, they were like, <laughs> they were like 19... 1970s or 80s model Andersons in like good shape. Single, single pane. <laughs> was, you could write your name on the inside of the window in the winter. <laughs> yeah, it was like 150 <laughs> bucks and they were they were uh, five foot by 11 foot and they were pictures on top with the, the fold out mm -hmm. awnings. And we're like, we're not having kids. So we ripped the all the awning is off. Hardware. Hardware, <laughs> hardware, <laughs> hardware off. Th threw it out. And then... Um, in the oh, I had screws screwed in, and we had little um, strings tied on. We'd tie them shut. That's how we kept them shut. And then every once in a while, like in the winter, when the wind was really whipping, like one would come loose, and you'd just like wham, it'd go <laughs> flying open, and you'd have to jump up and shut it. <laughs> but uh, and then when the just a side note on that, then when the kid when Ava came along, we're like we don't have these hinges for the windows to like keep them shut. So we actually built lattice like a little prison across <laughs> all those windows. <laughs> yeah. You got the uh, the the security bars in the middle of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was just silly things like that that you're like, why did I do that? But it was interesting to me. Like, I, it was early on when I first met you that you said you made a comment to me that I thought was interesting about. For those who don't know, we we still own and operate a tree care company right. here um, at Curian, and you made the comment that like, if things go down, I can always go back to, to doing tree work, which I thought was funny to me because it, it, you know, was like, I don't think things are, <laughs> I think it's like you're past that like phase in, in, in it. But having that philosophy, I found very interesting to, that, like, you know, just keeping something in your back pocket that, you know, Right. In case I needed to just still go back and climb trees, that that was there, um, which now it's its own successful business in itself right. without your, uh, you doing that. But um, what advice would the two of you have for people maybe listening, thinking about getting into any type of business? Like over the years, what lessons have you learned that you think are important for those looking to um, try something on their own or make their own business? I, 
I think one of the big things that I think about is um, not being afraid to take the risk. And I've, I've often talked to a lot of my friends who are like, you're so risky, like you take so much risk and, and they're afraid to give up their job and to take that step. And, and I kind of totally look at that different. And I'm like, you, you should be willing to take that up because you can always go get that job back. And like, there's always somebody out there that'll employ you. Um, if you come to the table, do good work. And, um, so having that ability to, to take that chance and then stay focused on the profitability and, and, and living below your means at all times, even when it's good, like we've always done that. And it's always given us the, the next step, the money's been there to help us, or if there's some kind of problem, it's there and you're not like, you're not leveraged. Do you think that your outlook of like, or both of you really, that like you never thought about money, like helped or, or not thinking about money allowed you to be riskier than what most people that maybe have that as a, a, a fear or worry? Like, was that a driving factor in like why you were willing to be so risky with some things? Well, I mean, I didn't never thought it was really risky, but I, I think that I always worked for free time. Like I used to always say that, like I work for free time. I don't work for money because I wanted to hunt and fish and be out outside. So that I think is a, a another aspect that, pa that pushes you is like being passionate about something other than money, right? That, that makes you jump out of bed in the morning and work really hard and work late, like influences you to do those kind of things without just like money at the end of it. And I still find myself that today, if it was just money, like I don't think I would be excited, but like, because the business is about feeding people wild protein and really like sh sharing Bristol Bay and protecting wild places, like that's what drives us. That's and I'm curious, Jen, what, um, <clears throat> kind of going back to that, when was it that you left education and like, did you have any fears about like making that leap or was the business established enough at that time that you were comfortable doing it? It's been 10 plus years, maybe 11, 12, something. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, uh, at that time I knew that it was what I had to do. Uh, there was just too much going on and it was very like, you know, working many, many hours a day and uh, not being able to focus on one or the other, you know, it, it was like, you just had, I just realized that it just, one of these has to take, take the front seat. So um, I did get a lot of uh, slack from my family and, and some other people that were afraid of giving up a state position with healthcare and all of the <laughs> bubbly things that come with it. And, you know, summer's off and, uh, but I, I wouldn't say that I was afraid. Um, that's one thing about, you know, wild for salmon has always, the, the salmon itself has pretty much sold itself. The, you know, it, it's such great quality that we really didn't have to be great marketers. You know, we just, we were honest, you know, we've caught this, it's amazing. And, uh, it's really done a nice job you know selling itself at the start so yeah i think that's that's one thing that like i appreciate about the business all the businesses that the two of you have built is like there is like a underlying theme of like just good honest like respectable products and services and i think that um too many times people are always going into any transaction whether it's service-based or uh, product based, like skeptical of like, what's the angle, like, you know, what, and I think that, um, it's almost like tougher to be an honest business in today's world because everybody's so skeptical, <laughs> um, that they're like, oh yeah, right. Um, but I think that that's such a cool dynamic that, you, that the two of you cre have created in the culture here, as well as like mentioning the, like being passionate about something. Like, I think that that, being an employee here and um, all the other employees that I've, I've talked with 
have that like appreciation for like that being a theme within the businesses is that like we don't care what you're passionate about but right. just be passionate about something <laughs> you know? exactly like very cool um any closing thoughts for this series of your background and history i know that you had mentioned that there's a lot more stories that i'm sure we're going to dig into more in detail <laughs> at, at another time but um any any last closing thoughts or advice or um, follow your dreams words of wisdom <laughs> follow your dreams. just do it <laughs> just, just do, do it. it that one's already taken yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> uh all right well i appreciate uh the time and thanks for tuning in and uh make sure to check us out next week with a new episode thanks salmon cast is a production of curian fisheries the show is hosted by steve curian and dustin hamilton Produced by Dustin Hamilton, Courtney Rainford, and Aubrey McNeil.